Jam. It's the record label and logo hip hop artists dream of being on. Def Jam tells you who I am. If I never sell a record again, just to say that I was a part of Def Jam Records is enough for me. They've broken the biggest acts in the business, from LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys to Jay Z, Ja Rule, and DMX. Are you ready? You can't tell the story of hip hop without telling the Def Jam story. All right, hey, you said uncensored. For the first time, uncensored reveals the Def Jam videos they didn't want you to know existed. It will be embarrassing. Behind the scenes disaster. I'm not gonna say any names. You know, I have to protect the innocent. In the moment, some artists are trying hard to forget. Somebody told you to dig that up. Now the people who are there give up the real deal. That's, That's my story, story and, I'm and I'm sticking to it. To it. Behind Def Jam, uncensored. When Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin started Def Jam Recordings, few thought the adventure would ever last. In fact, in 1984, some people didn't even consider rap real music. Ronald Reagan led the free world, and MTV looked and sounded like this. I want my MTV! Under the pop music radar, b-boys and breakdancers across inner city New York were up rocking to a different beat. I had made a, uh, a rap record called It's Yours by Tila Rock, and I already had designed the Def Jam logo and had it on the Tila Rock record before I'd ever met Russell. That was on the radio, like, oh, this is the highest joy. When he met me, he couldn't believe that I had made that record because I was white. Commentating, illustrating, description giving, adjective expert. Analyzing soft minds of people love the universe. This is That was the beginning of a revolution. The broke college students pulled four thousand dollars to expand Def Jam recordings. Their humble beginnings were immortalized in the 1985 hip hop movie Crush Group. Yo, that's a hundred orders I already took today, and everybody wants them yesterday. The the first Def Jam office was in Weinstein Dormitory at NYU. I wouldn't refer to it as, as like one of Def Jam's offices. It was just like that's the space that we were sitting in. We would have stacks of boxes of records being delivered to the dorm and you know, shipped out all over the country. Rick had left the address, which was his dorm's address, on the back of It's Yours. Meanwhile, James Todd Smith, an ambitious 16-year-old from Hollis, Queens, was trying to launch his rap career. He dubbed himself... Ladies, I looked at every record that looked or sounded like it might be rap or related to that type of music, and I wrote all the addresses to all those record labels there, and then I sent tapes to all those labels. I used to call Rick every day. I ain't even remember the message. This is Rick, I'm not here right now. Leave a message. Boop. Me and Adam Harvitz from the Beastie Boys heard it and really loved it. He called back, so I went crazy and it was like unbelievable. He came to the dorm and I had a meeting with him and we kind of liked each other and shook hands and decided we were going to start making records together. That was our first Def Jam release. It was not done through no major label, it was independent. We put it out with the burgundy label. Def Jam's sophomore signing was a trio of Jewish punk rockers from New York. In just a few months, hit singles from LL and the Beasties brought Def Jam street credibility barreling into the boardroom. Then Sony's subsidiary, Columbia Records, saw gold. Sony came along, and Sony did, Al Teller did make the deal and give us an opportunity. One missed opportunity for Def Jam was the signing of Russell's younger brother, Joey, in the rest of Run DMC. Run DMC was not on Def Jam because they came out before Def Jam was existed. But Run DMC was still a part of the extended Def Jam family. Simmons and another one of his partners, a no-nonsense Israeli promoter named Lior Cohen, managed to trill through a sideline business called Rush Artist Management. Between Rush and Def Jam, they led an all-star rap lineup. But a controversial group that would help secure Def Jam's place in music history almost never made the team. Here's a group calling itself Public Enemy, and they were the Black Panthers of rap. Public Enemy was led by a politically charged frontman, Chuck D. And the unforgettable spark plug, Flavor Flav. 
Russell was afraid of public enemy to begin with because he took politics as preachiness. But Rick Rubin knew kids would buy the message. We was introducing something to the music business that was totally new to everybody there. Public Enemy style, message, and makeup would leave an indelible mark on hip hop, spawning a generation of politically conscious artists. But at one point, Def Jam considered stripping PE of one of its hallmarks, Flavor Flay. Now, I just wanted to sign Chuck P, the, the artist. They just didn't understand why we wanted to have Flavor in the group. Yeah, boy! Flavor was one of the first, you know, hype men. It's cold to the night, so turn me loose. We convinced them after they heard the records and they saw how he basically balanced the group. Ah. And so they decided, we'll let this go. Def Jam wasn't above poaching artists from other acts to fill out his roster. I was started off with Dougie Fresh. I wasn't signed, so we made a record called Lottie Dottie and the show. And those records like, like, whoosh. Slick Rick is the guy who came up with all the rhymes, so it made perfect sense that I would go to try to sign him. I remember we had to go and meet Ricky. Back then, you know, I used to do my little weed thing, you know what I mean? I think somebody put some dust in my weed, you know, so I was like bugging out for a minute. Went to the hospital to dry off, whatever you want to call it. You met him at the nut house. Just signed me up right in the hospital. Of course, they let him out the nut house. Big, big day for Def Jam. Def Jam wasn't just going out on a limb to sign new acts. They were creating stars that would change the sound and look of urban music. Russell never liked costumes and shiny stuff. The first show I ever did, I had like some crazy leather boots on, like Rick James boots. The boots was part of like, you know, Rick James was a star. <laughs> We aspired to be stars. Because I had seen Flash and all these different performers. I thought that's the way you're supposed to dress. Like, that's the uniform. Russell was, like, getting drunk up in the booth, like, smoking. Like, yo, your boots, the boots, you're killing me. You need the boots. I said, you can go home and put on your shell toes now, because it's real. He told me, yo, chill, just dress the way you normally dress. <laughs> The hat would become LL's signature statement, but he wasn't Def Jam's only fashion play. Slick Rick the Ruler was also developing his high post style, but even with his growing success, the trappings of wealth were still hard to come by, especially at the last minute. And the Slick Rick teenage love video shoot was like a nightmare. All I really wanted, I wanted, I gotta have um, a Rolls Royce, <laughs> a mink coat. That's kind of hard to rent a full length fur coat or, or mink coat or, or, you know, or anything at, at 1 o'clock in the morning. They got an old Rolls Royce. It wasn't up to date one, but it's a Rolls is a Rolls. And, you know, I borrowed uh, Big Daddy Kane's rope chain. I got the mink. When you watch today, even, the teenage video, you probably wonder, you know, that, that fur coat looks a little ill-fitting. Well, it's because we borrowed somebody's grandmother's fur coat for him to wear. He actually kind of made it work. Talking about Ghetto Fabulous, he was the truest version of Ghetto Fabulous you'll ever see. In fact, I think at several parties later on, you start to see young brothers wearing their grandmother's fur coats. You know, it's one of those things where b-boys create style. Over the years, this hip-hop empire has gone through several changing of the guards. The label and its artists have evolved, and nowhere is that clearer than with the Beastie Boys. There's something I really want to talk about tonight, while I have the time. I think we can talk to the promoters, make sure that they're doing something about the safety of all the girls and the women that come to our shows. Make sure they know and understand about sexual harassment. I see the Beastie Boys probably forgot about their whole history. Our number one band will have an inflatable phallus that will rise at the end of each show. I believe it was Adam Yauch's idea, although I'm not sure. The penis was just like the, oh no! <laughs> that stage prop. I, I don't like using the word penis. There was a discussion about it spurting, but it, we didn't, it didn't spurt. We were too broke at the time to have things come out of the, the prop. Parents was actually like hiding their kids because they thought they were a nice pop group. They didn't understand the mindset of the Beastie Boys. The more parents upset, the more we felt that we um, were barking up the right tree. Coming up, the videos Def Jam never wanted you to see. I didn't have a problem with it. I guess they thought it was too unique. 
Over the years, Def Jam has created hundreds of memorable music videos. But here's an LL Cool J video you've never seen. I was swerving through Queens, fully grown bands, searching for the butters through my Cartier lens. In 1997, West Coast rap videos were flashy and loud. Following his success with Phenomenon, LL Cool J took a chance with the larger-than-life trend. We shot a video for LL Cool J called Hot, Hot, Hot. That was um, pretty disastrous. The Hot, Hot, Hot video, it was just this weird, you know, foray into, like, I don't know if it was hell or what. At the time, it wasn't where LL needed to go. I didn't have a problem with it. I guess they thought it was too unique, creative. I don't know. Everybody agreed real quickly. I mean, that was a very fast decision that it would not see the light of day. Yeah, uh, I got it right where I wanna. Reality about to creep up on her. I work for them, they don't work for me, so they can do it like that. If it ain't right, it ain't right. And it ain't coming out of this building. Def Jam was prepared for any problem. In 1995, Slick Rick was unavailable for his video shoot for sitting in my car. Sitting in the car, they dissed me. Well, he was away, he was locked up. I was in jail when he was playing it. We cut, pasted, put a patch on the person real quick, quick shots, quick shots here and there. I wasn't even in the video. They had a guy that looked like me play me. Yo, that is whack. I'm not proud of it, and I want to say I'm sorry to Ricky for that. Given the situation again, I wouldn't do it. The bottom line is that we are greedy bastards. California. Heading into the mid-90s, Def Jam hit a dry spell. West Coast gangster rap dominated the charts, and Def Jam was no longer the master of hip hop. That was so dark for Def Jam. No one wanted to give us any artists. No producers really cared about giving us hot tracks. So Def Jam was willing to experiment. This was the case with Method Man's Grammy winning record, You're All I Need. Method Man is this hardcore dude. He didn't want to get this soft image by making this love song. I wanted to do it as a record, but I just didn't want to put it out as a single. Legend has it that Lior had a conversation and made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I told him to buy me a car, but I didn't use the money for a car. I think I invested it. And then there was an idea like, yo, we need to make a duet. An unknown Lauren Hill was approached. Lauren used to always come to our offices downtown. And I was like, that's it. Lauren and Matt for duet for all I need. This is when the Fuji's, they weren't so hot. They didn't sell 100 million records. I walked the idea into Lior, and he's like, Fuji's? Who the are the Fuji's, Jason? It never happened. No, when I think of you, I'm thinking of myself. Mary was like, I love Method Man. I love his record. He's incredible. Could you get me an autograph CD? And then I was like, bingo, that's it. So uh, I ran into Leo's office and I was like, what about Mary J. Blige? And he didn't throw me out. Mary J. was perfect for it. And it took her a split second to agree to it. And it was a good idea too, boy, because she, she, I don't think I could hear anybody else on that song. I knew Meth and Mary was going to be a big spinner. And when it came on the Jukebox Network, I knew a lot of people was watching. In 1995, struggling independent producer Irv Gotti used that video to get his foot in the door at Def Jam. I was with my group, Cash Play Click, and we had a record called Get the Forge. I, got your mind wide open and your back to keep it I used to sit at home and I used to watch the Jukebox Network, and every time I seen Meth and Mary, I would order Cash Money Click, Get the Forge. We had the number for like every city. So we go and we jack the box. And it cost me thousands of dollars, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get in. And at that same time, Def Jam was searching relentlessly for a star to lead them back to the top. All I did was try to find that needle in the haystack. All I wanted to do was sign a star. So I'm sitting in the office and I'm watching the box. And all of a sudden, there comes this wonderful black and white video. And there was this kid rapping with the biggest voice I've heard since Chuck D. Skies, I'm a shadow with red eyes, I stay high. Leo stopped and said, 
That kid right there has got something. He's going to be a star. So I cold called Ja. He wanted to take a meet with us just to see where our heads was at. It changed my career. Meeting Ja and Irv from that one phone call. You know, Irv was one who brought both Ja, DMX, and he DJed for Jay-Z. And so began a new wave of success at Def Jam that carried them into the 21st century. Holla, holla, anybody that's ready to get dollar, dollar. Come on, if you roll it with me, bada, bada, it's murder. Can I get a what, what, do these chickens from all of my dubs who don't love dough? They get no dough. Can I get a... Jay-Z featuring... In 1998, DMX's solo debut video, Get At Me Dog, may have been too real for MTV. MTV said we can't at play your video because the lyrics were inappropriate for standards. If you know XX, he hates changing his lyrics or anything. I know what's real to me. That's all that counts. No, for real, that you can't like X. You gotta flip your lyrics. Music stays the same, just flip them. And he's like, no, man. That's why I'm spitting what I'm spitting. That's how I'm living, how I'm living. Doing what I'm doing, you know what I mean? Getting what I'm getting. And I'm like, but X, what about all the kids who live in, like, Bumber, Middle America, that there's no urban radio? X goes into a rage. Er, er, what? <laughs> that? I don't make my mother music for them. I'm not changing for them. And he looks me dead in the face and he says, real dog sniff blood. Julie, see, she's going like this. And then I call my boss, Leo, and I'm like, real dog sniff blood. <laughs> to this day, Get At Me Dog has never aired in its entirety on MTV. Coming up, a $2 million mistake when Def Jam Uncensored returns. It was corny. It was corny. I can't lie. Sam hasn't survived for 15 years by following some kind of hip-hop rule book. They simply went with their gut, took some chances, and never looked back until now. The legendary label has decided to tell all. For example, here's a Cisco video Def Jam vowed would never see the light of day. Right now, right before your very eyes, what we're doing is unleashing the dragon. We're awaiting the much-anticipated arrival of Cisco. Cisco has this great idea that he, you know, for a single Unleash the Dragon, this is coming off a thong song, which is such a giant video for him and for us. He comes up with this idea that he's going to fight a dragon. I welcome the challenge. A dragon's not afraid of anything. It was going to be like a thriller type of event. It was going to be like almost a 10 minute mini movie. They were going to air it in its entirety. You know, we get Martin Weiss, who just did a great video for him before, special effects. We was all, yo, yeah, we're going to do this. Yeah, come on. Uh, Being on set, I mean, I was in awe. I was like, oh, my God, he's running up the side of the building. He's acting. <laughs> but it was really cool. Man, I had ran up the dragon's arm, and we was fighting, and the dragon breathed fire. Cut. Right. Excellent. All I know is that it was a disaster. We get our first rough cut, and it was just the worst thing ever. Hey! What do you think you're doing? Coming up here and scaring people, stepping on cars. And I'm shot what it, at the end it just looked like puff the magic dragon and it just looked nuts yeah, i can't lie it was corny it was a little corny and we were just flabbergasted like this could ruin his career i mean this is like a two million dollar video it was hard for them to tell him that this could never Ever, 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 air. Shelve it.
More than one Def Jam shoot has gotten a little out of control. In April 1989, acclaimed director Spike Lee staged a rally for the Public Enemy Fight the Power video shoot. There's powers that keep us down, and, and you know, the song is about we got to fight the powers that be. Spike came up with the uh, concept of actually doing a mini political rally right in Bed-Stuy, pretty much where he shot the Do the Right Thing film, and it was to be led by Public Enemy. When we got out there, it was, and it was early in the morning. It was like 6, six o'clock in the morning, and you seeing, like, sea of people, and we were like, whoa. And to everyone's amazement, the sea of people transformed the state stage rally into a real life rally. Let me see somebody put up a fist. We started doing more and more takes of this. More and more people just coming out of the woodworks. There had been a parade through Brooklyn. Al Sharpton showed up. When you're dealing with this many people, you're always going to have some sort of problem as far as crowd control. There's no need to rush. Don't rush anything. Everybody's in the video. Oh Maybe next year we can put one of these things together and go down to Wall Street see if we can get some money. It took the vibe of the street and it just took the sheer energy of Public Enemy on stage and put it in one video. An estimated 5,000 people joined Public Enemy that day to fight the power. We've got to fight the power that beach. Just a job that Spike did in terms of setting up the imaging of Public Enemy with banners and signs, don't believe the hype and fight the power. It was visually like nothing we had seen or even have seen since. Fight the power. Macadocious, atrocious and potious, boy. Def Jam's never been afraid to try something new. And in the mid-90s, they were desperate for a rap act that could compete with the West Coast hip-hop scene. Yeah, so you know I'm coming at you. I guess that's part of the game. In 1994, Russell Simmons was convinced he'd found a sound to do it. Russell Simmons was pushing big time. The new trend is not gangster rap. It's going to be horrorcore. <laughs> Well, who, who brought that up? Why didn't bring up horrorcore? Horrorcore is going to be it. You see him another time. Horrorcore is going to be it. And he said it's going to be kind of like Ozzy Osbourne meets Onyx. We went ahead and we did a story on it, just in case this was going to be the next thing. The Flatliners, who say they are the creators of this new trend, recently released their debut single, Live Evil. The video, which does not air on MTV, features hip-hop mogul Russell Simmons' nephew, Red Rum, rapping from a noose. Oh, Jamel, is my nephew. When we got the video for the Flatliners, I was just like, this is, I'm sorry. They've got Red Rum, murder spelled backwards, and then they had another guy who's literally rapping from the grave, you know? He's like six feet in the ground. You know, it was weird because they actually had rhyme skills, but I think they were looking for a gimmick. And I'm like, I just don't know if black kids are gonna like this. As far as rapping from the grave, I'd rather deal with the living instead of the dead. Nobody felt like anybody wanted to hear sort of like devil worship. It was the makeup and it was nuts. It was Russell's nephew. What do you want to do? <laughs> we had a lot of whack choices. That wasn't the only whack choice. I still think the record's all right. I'm just how many bananas I am. But Def Jam always seemed to bounce back, gaining intense respect inside the industry. The tough part was staying out of trouble. Def Jam hit it big with Montel Jordan's 1995 smash, This Is How We Do It. So Lior Cohen decided Jordan's follow-up video should go where hip-hop videos had never gone before. Be creative. Do something special. It's funner that way. We're trying to figure out what we're going to do for the video, something for the honeys. And I don't know who comes up with this golf concept, but Lior, that's it, that's fly. Ghetto golf, that's what we need to be doing. Oh. We're gonna do a hip hop golf tournament. Pipe Williams got us one of the most magnificent golf courses ever. Like, just a billionaire state golf course. They didn't even know what we were doing. They thought we were shooting a Michael Jordan commercial. They didn't know it was Montel Jordan. We lied to them. We didn't tell them we were in the urban music business at all. We roll in with production and we've got like 200 of these like amazing, scantily clad young girls from LA and literally every rapper you can think of. I mean, Snoop comes, Nate Dogg comes, all of our artists come. I mean, it was incredible. Running from the top. All of a sudden, you know, it was, it started getting a little hectic. Shut that off. 
turned into a riot. Two artists that were signed for us got into a fight with the dog pound. And the undercover security guards start pulling guns, you know, telling people to get down on the ground. I remember seeing cars being crashed and bottles being broken. And we spent all this money on this magnificent golf course, and they threw us out. And they had to shut down our video. Most video shoots are uneventful, even boring. It's like watching paint dry on the wall. It's just, you sit there and wait. But one Def Jam exec got more than she bargained for on a shoot with Redman. Do I have to tell that story? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're on the set of Whatever Man. It's the video, him and Method are the Blues Brothers, and we're on Randall's Island. So we're in the trailer. I think I was changing, I had some shorts on. And, <laughs> and for some reason, I had major, major, major bondage. And so he's standing there. <laughs> I was just playing though, right? I was like, you need it, yo, look. And I'm thinking that he's being funny, taking one of the, you know, bananas or whatever else that was in the trailer. She's like, boy, that's a big ass stick, that boy. And I hit it. <laughs> and it bounces back at me. And I'm like screaming like, ah! <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I hate that story. <laughs> Coming up, Def Jam's Survival of the Illest Tour lives up to his name. I don't know actually what happened with the crash, but I, I think somebody left the bus in neutral. Yes, Def Jam has been bringing some of the hottest and most memorable live acts to the stage. Here's an uncensored mega mix of some unforgettable Def Jam performances. Check it out now, check it out now, check it out. My mind's on the rhyme, ain't a damn thing funny, getting money. Ain't nobody there, nobody there. The way I play, your crew, damn it, damn it. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you wear your bros, your wrist is slow to sit. More O's than you know it's shit. It's just my women, if you with me, you with me. I'm talking about good living, I'll be here, you with me. I can't make it. Me, but I bet you keep telling you we better than me. Ooh, no, My go drop, go drop, and then we go shut down. Oh, 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 star power in live performances is the MTV Video Music Awards. And in 1999, when MTV invaded the Met, the stage was set for the biggest and final VMAs of the millennium. As industry execs scrambled for highly coveted bookings, Def Jam was thrilled to book a duet with the two rappers responsible for putting the label back on the map. The first year, we booked Jay-Z and DMX, and I was so excited. But on the day of rehearsal, with less than 24 hours until showtime, DMX pulled a no-show. What do you mean he's not coming? You know, we're, we're live tomorrow night, what does that mean? We're panicked. We've done the stage, we've done publicity, everything is driving to this 
performance DMX and Jay-Z. No one has never pulled a no-show for the MTV Music Awards. The saving grace for Def Jam would be Jay-Z's solo crowd-moving performance. I don't think I was allowed back in the MTV building for like three months after that. In the year 2000, Julie again began persuading MTV to book X as a performer at the VMAs. Since then, DMX had shown up for numerous other award shows. We knew he was coming this time. Her line was convincing, and MTV decided, reluctantly, to extend X an offer. I heard jokes up in the building. There were rumors and pools going around that he wasn't going to be there. Surprise, surprise. For the second year in a row, DMX was a no-show, and MTV was forced to scramble to fill his spot. I sat there, I shook my head, I'm like, I can't believe this. Would think they would learn their lesson from the first year. Having to go back over to Radio City Music Hall and look at the same people in the face one more time it was the most horrific experience. To add salt to the wound, Cisco, who was also scheduled to perform, was missing on the day of rehearsal. They were all on a plane coming to New York to make this rehearsal. Well, you know, the clock is just ticking away. She's calling me and paging me 911 that Cisco, because of bad weather, could not make rehearsal. One by one, the airport started to close. We're on the phone, MTV Productions on the phone, finding like alternative routes, estimated times of arrival. The overtime was gonna be like 20, 20, 30,000 dollars to keep the crew there for just an extra hour. What am I gonna do? There's no one here. I need, I need approval. He didn't rehearse, because he didn't make it there in time, but we were able to squeeze in, you know, a little rehearsal time before the run through. So it all worked out. His performance was awesome. And, you know, I kept my job. <laughs> Though absent from the VMAs, when present, Darkman X performs with an intensity and passion that one night on tour almost cost him his life. The Hard Knock tour was like, they did like 50 shows in like 58 days, which is, is unheard of in touring. X performed a half an hour set by himself, no hype man. X just doing his X stuff and he's sitting there dripping wet. I mean, if you've ever seen him perform, you know that it's like he gives everything. I want to hit everybody, but I want to hit everybody. I don't want to have my man hit a few people. I, have, I want me to hit everybody. Where my dogs at? Where my dogs at? Where I go show? He's all over the stage, and he has asthma. He comes off stage and collapses, having an asthma attack. I believe they put him on a gurney, and, you know, we're going to take him out. During Jay's set, they do a song called Money Cash Holes, where... X is obviously featured on the record. So X is in the back, they're trying to talk him into going to the hospital. He's like, I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving. So he just like took the asthma pump and just like, you know. So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, he growls. <laughs> and the crowd just went bananas. <laughs> he told me he, he would probably rap to death. After years of live performances, if there's one lesson Def Jam's learned, is that anything can happen on tour. Oh my God, the bus crashed. That was on my bus, actually. So the tour buses pull up, all these guys get out. X gets out with his pit bulls following him. I don't know actually what happened with the crash. We're all just talking and everything, and the bus just starts going down the street. I think somebody left the bus in neutral or something. Rolled down the hill. And no one's really noticing because they just figure somebody's driving the bus. And then it just like crashes into a brownstone. Yeah, you should have caught it. Yeah, you seen it? You caught it? Why was it? We had it on camera, surprisingly. I don't even know why. And then my publicist calls me. She's like, oh my God, we just hit a building. You know, it's, it, it probably was one of us because I'm not gonna say any names. You got all the modulations going on, the seat rises, goes up and down. Who knows who, like, who was behind the wheel of the bus and left in the neutral, you know? And when touring abroad, Def Jam learned early on that a cultural misunderstanding can lead to a very heated situation. You're watching MTV Europe. The Paris concert was, we had a sold out Beastie Boy Run DMC show. I think that was the first time that, like any of them had been in Europe. We was performing Walk This Way when a, when a, when a fight break out nah, or something. Nah. The crowd 
crowd was spitting on stage at the guy. Hold it now. I guess that's their way of showing, you know, a sign of affection. But to us, it was like, you know, spit is spit. Our tour manager at the time saw that and did like a somersault and flung himself in the middle of the audience. He started kicking everybody in the face. It was like a machine gun, and there were like French people falling out. Remember that Israel Horowitz was there, you know, and his kid was Adam Horowitz, King Ad Rock. He was like, geez, this rap is violent. And those kids that got their asses whipped um, went and, and started pouring gas on our bus. By the time we came outside, they was gone. The people who wrecked the bus, they was gone. So we come out there, and we're just missing a marshmallows and a stick because that bus was gone. Coming up, we'll spend a day in the life at Def Jam. We have some things I have to do. You know what I mean? You can they let you be who you are, you know what I mean? That's Bibby. He likes to make me deaf every day. And then I shut the door and he gets mad at me. I want the door open, let my music out, and let my company know. Who's responsible? Sometimes the anything goes attitude can be misleading. In 1996, a struggling Jay-Z dropped by with an offer he thought President Kevin Lyles couldn't refuse. Jay had a record called Ain't No. It's a record that he made with Foxy Brown. Foxy Brown just came out and he couldn't get it on the radio and it, it kind of pissed him off. At the time, I didn't know who Kevin Lyles was, but he was regarded as the best radio person in the business who works at Def Jam. So I said, yo, Jay, listen, y'all niggas take a bag full of money and go bribe Kevin Lyles. They actually came to my office and they came with a big brown paper bag, you know what I mean? <laughs> Everyone thinks you can just pay radio to get records played. Get out of here. Kevin Lyles, being the honest Joe he is, did not accept the bribe. We don't do that here. That's not what we do. But what he did, he said, I love the record. I can put it on Nutty Professor, shoot a video, and then it'll be on Def Jam. So that's how Rockefeller first got introduced with Def Jam. These days, Jay-Z rolls into Def Jam on a regular basis. For many artists, it's a home away from home. <laughs> this is ludicrous. Standing on Kevin Lyle's desk right now. Yeah, baby, I'm at Def Jam. If somebody's in town or, you know, something's going on, at least once a day you'll see somebody. <laughs> Relationships between artists and execs are tight, like family. Everybody jokes about everybody around here. Even the president. You know, I used to be in Millie Vanilli. If I could curse her, it'd be a real problem right there. When you roll girl, you know it's true. You know, hey, we gonna, we gonna go there. The record was girl, you know it's true. I originally recorded the record back in 86 for my group, New Marks. It was horrible, like really bad, like just bad. They found two other guys, um, I guess Billy Vanilli, and they redid the song, and the rest is history. <laughs> wow. They not here no more, Eric. I'm still here. We're gonna be all right, all right? Seven million. Seven million. It doesn't matter where you came from, Def Jam gives the hungry an opportunity to grow. Def Jam as a label is probably, to me, the best label on the planet because everybody that's in Def Jam has came up through the ranks. I was just an intern, and, you know, nine years later, I, um, sitting here as a president, so, you know. If Def Jam was a place where an intern became president, why couldn't today's intern drop the next hit album? And that's my music playing in the background right there, you know what I mean? It's a blessing how I got a job up at Def Jam. What? I'm on the low, I'm an artist. I'ma take over the whole market. My freestyle strip retarded. <laughs> On the future, look out for me. Peace. I don't even like calling them employees because they're my partners. I have right now at this company at least five people that are way better than me. Way better than me. Everybody loves Leo. Because you need that pep talk, you right there, boy. And it's like, that voice is more recognizable than mine, Chuck D's, Buster Rhymes, any that. When you hear Leo, you know it's Leo. You guys are running a the muck. Everybody in the Def Jam family knows that voice. The competition lies in who does it best. Don't make me waste my money on you, you little mother I want you to go out there and be fabulous for these people. I think it's 
hysterical. We're going to take rap music to another level. Where are you going? Like real life stuff. Could you kibitz with me? Yeah. I swear to God, no, seriously. Okay, not gonna use that. Some call it a university, others say it's a cult. I'm not gonna say it's a cult, I'm gonna say it's culture. A culture that breeds intense competition and camaraderie that follows them from the office into the studio and on the road, as Uncensored found behind the scenes of the Hard Knock Life tour. If people didn't realize it, backstage it was like chaos. Oh man, we had like a war. It was like Rockefeller versus Rough Riders. And they were, you know, kidnapping members from each other's groups and holding them for ransom. DMX and them, they would kidnap Dame Dash and call Jay and be like, yo, Jay, we got Dame. What do you want to do? <laughs> yeah. We had fun. When you get a group of artists together like that, that respect each other, not even necessarily like each other, you know, it's, it's got to be a respect thing. Everybody can fuse together and have a good time. I get you back, though. Trust me. It's kind of like being in an NBA, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm playing already, you know what I'm saying? It's good to meet you, dog. I can just tell you that my, the whole experience at Def Jam, the whole beginnings till now, has been a, you know, an amazing ride. It's not just a record company, but it is a institution. I'm the pinnacle, that means I reign supreme And I'm notorious, I'll crush you like a jelly bean I'm bad My name is LL Cool J That's two L's, a capital C, and a J2 When I was in the fourth grade and I'm bad came out. I knew like every word to that song. Rabbit out the hat, pulling Afro tricks. Afro American, Afro. We big now, I guess. Get a picture of that. Put that back on there. This is how I used to pick up girls for many years. Jazz, tell me the first time. Oh, Russ, talk about the clothes. Yeah, yeah. I got the logo. Can you see my logo? Do you have my logo in here, man? No, he's making an Italian <laughs> version, though. He's doing Italian platform. That's a smaller cut. Yeah, I own underwear. Wait, I always have my own underwear. Just a natural born hustler. I'm gonna produce this piece as well, if you don't mind. We're proud to be on this label. We're proud to be here on uh, MTV Def Jam Uncensored. You know what I'm saying? Because we some uncensored mother. And, and I won't be there to edit it, but you will see clearly how to edit it. Cut.